Questwell. Our guest is Dr. Francis Questwell, senior, no stranger to WOL. Dr. Wilson, welcome back to WOL. Oh, I'm very glad to be with you, Carl. Uh, Dr. Dr. Wilson, got to ask you about the name, the Washington Redskins. We just found out that the owner, Dan Snyder, has trademarked uh, the name Washington Bravehearts. Uh, so he's, and this is breaking news for all you Redskins football fans. He's trademarked the name, the Washington Bravehearts. So he's been under pressure to change the name. Is, does this have anything to to do with your theory of the crest color of of, of uh, color confrontation? Does this have anything to do with the fact that he he was so I guess it, I guess he still is, if, if you will, as steadfast against changing the name Redskins. He didn't think that that was uh, he didn't think that was insulting to Native Americans. Well, again, you know, my uh, start point is understanding that uh, we are in the uh, system dynamic of racism, white supremacy, and so calling well mistreating, first of all, genociding the Native Americans who were at one point called Redskins. And uh, so to have people of color demeaned in one way or the other is standard operating perception in the system that we're in. Uh, so the fact that uh, the name was changed, uh, well, I give any changed. person credit for reaching another level of insight and understanding. I had suggested at one point they could call them the all-skins. <laughs> <laughs> you see, so that people of every hue, including white, uh, you know, would be represented. But uh, Bravehearts, is that what it is? Well, yeah, he's, he's registered that as a trademark. So he hasn't changed the name yet officially, but uh, it's interesting to know that he has, uh, he, he, he says the, for entertainment services in the form of professional football games and exhibitions, and he filed that with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. So people are thinking that he may be, he may be caving in. Well, uh, let's give him credit and say that he's gaining insight <laughs> and he's waking up. And in a point of endarkenment, uh, that's the substitute for enlightenment. Uh, so, you know, if he's realizing that uh, he wouldn't want to be insulted on a daily basis and other people don't like to be demeaned and insulted, which is uh, par for the course and necessity for the system of racism, which is why I'm an advocate of. Every person, whether they classify themselves as white or non-white, meaning the black, brown, red, and yellow people, people with skin pigmentation, that we will all go forward and advance if we are able to, as Eric Holder, the Attorney General, said, stop being a nation of cowards and being unable to talk about racism. Racism is the 500-year-old dynamic power dynamic in this area of the world and to be unable to discuss it uh, means that we are really discrediting ourselves meaning that we don't have the courage to face reality and face the truth so anytime we take a baby step forward and begin to have some level of understanding very good but I do think that uh, I wrote something the other day that anyone who refuses to talk about racism, white supremacy, hates black people. <laughs> now, some people might be offended by that, but racism, white supremacy is like a spear in the heart of black people, causing their early death and all kinds of other impairments. And so when we refuse to talk about it for maybe personal gain in one way or another, we are doing a disservice. You see, it's, it's like if you put it in the case of the Semites of the Jewish religion. If anti-Semitism was going on in a location and people refused to acknowledge it, but that was what was destroying the people, then the people who were engaging in the denial of that reality 
does he have to take some responsibility? In the same way, when there is a denial that we are in a system of racism, white supremacy. See, we are content to talk about schools closing in black communities. We are silent about the implications of gentrification. We are silent about the killings that take place amongst young black men. All of these things are symptoms of the dynamic of racism, white supremacy. I was looking at an article in the Washington Post, was it yesterday or the day before, uh, where they were talking about all the changes that are taking place in the different demographics that are now in the District of Columbia, and oh, how wonderful. But at the same time, if you drew a line under and added up what the article was saying, there's no place for black people. Right, I saw that article. And let me just correct something here, because this was in the Washington Times. He says it wasn't Snyder who trademarked it. Oh, it was it. in the Times? It, it, yeah, it, it, it's, this story is in the Washington Times. It was his neighbor, and this is how they do it, folks. Is, you know, if somebody did it out of his one of his top lieutenants, it, it'd be obviously a, a red flag. But it was a guy who lives next door to him, his neighbor, who trademarked the name uh, 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 Washington Bravehearts. But, but anyway, I saw that article because they were saying that actually that uh, a lot of the babies being born in the district now uh, are non-black, put it that way. Yes, because black people are being systematically moved out of the city. And I know any number of black people who are saying, I know exactly how the Native Americans felt. Do you mm. see when they were being pushed out and pushed onto reservations, pushed away from the dynamic city dynamic of what is happening. And so I maintain that instead of people getting upset about it, but they look at it and they begin to talk about what what is this all about? See, this is all about, this is a dimension of racism, white supremacy. And Wait, let me in interrupt you for a second here, Doc, because I had a, and this is a question that somebody tweeted after you, the last time you were on. This is, why does Dr. Wilson always see things through racial, a racial prism? Why does it always have to be, uh, white supremacy is, you know, that we should be concerned with? So, and I, I would I, just ask the person, why are you required to classify yourself in the census based on your skin color? Why is that on your driver's license? Uh. Did you object? <laughs> Do you <laughs> see? And if you object it, it doesn't mean anything. You will still be classified as either white or one category of non-white. This is the dynamic. That's like a question asking, uh, well, why were black people enslaved? Black people were enslaved by people who classify themselves as white. That's the reality. We are talking about health disparities. Black people have more hypertension. Black people have more diabetes. Black people have more kidney disease. All of these things are related to racism and the stress that racism imposes on black people as a dynamic system structure 24-7 times 365 times whatever your lifetime is until that system is replaced with a system of justice. But see, the individual who said, why does Dr. Welsing talk about Racism, you know, that would be like uh, being at the North Pole and say, why are people talking about snow? Mm. Or, Hank, or hold that thought right there, Doc, because we've got to take a quick break, and I'll let you expound on the other side, because uh, I think uh, the, the, the question is more telling about that person who's asking the question of you. But I'll let you expound on the other side. Folks, you two can join our conversation with Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. It's real simple. It's 800 450 7876. 800 450 7876. We'll take your calls right after. This podcast was recorded by BKRPodcast.com. 
And thank you for staying with us, folks. And, of course, you can always reach us on Facebook and Twitter at carlnelsonshow.com. Our guest is a noted psychiatrist, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. The number to call to speak to Dr. Welsing is 800-450-7876. Before the break, we were asking Dr. Welsing, because we got a tweet after the last time she was on, and someone said that she always sees things uh, through the prism of, of, of uh Black and white, I guess he was saying. I'm trying to remember the exact tweet was. Why does he, and it seems more, uh, it seems to, I, I guess the onus is on him, cause, uh, or her, who, who, who tweeted that, it seems like they're apologizing. I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm saying it right, Dr. Wilson, cause he says that everything that you see, it's always black and white. White folks are trying to keep us down, but I'll let you finish responding to that. Well, Carl, you know, when I, uh, trained in psychiatry, they, uh, taught us that the function of the psychiatrist is to help people face reality even when they are afraid to do so and so reality is what it is it's like if you were on the fourth floor of a building and you wanted to leave and you saw you know maybe there was a terrorist and if you decided I don't feel like thinking about I'm on the fourth floor I want to go outside, and so I'll just walk over the balcony. <laughs> because I don't want to face the fact that I'm on the fourth floor. It's too much trouble for me to walk out the door, walk down the hall perhaps, and get on the elevator. I want to be outside and on the sidewalk right now, so I don't want to think about reality. Well, then that's a dead person. So reality has to be confront it and the job of psychiatric physicians at least before they try to or are trying to change that into your role is just to write a prescription for the person who might be depressed or so called bipolar or anxious being made anxious by a dysfunctional environment but don't take time to talk to the person about that. Just give them a pill. Do you see? Or just legalize marijuana so they don't have to really reflect on something that may be difficult to reflect on. So facing reality is very important. Reality being that data that your sensory apparatus brings into your brain about what is going on. So, so basically they're, they're just involved in escapism. Well, you see, I maintain that racism has been structured consciously and subconsciously by people who classify themselves as white for their genetic survival on, a, on this planet. Whites are a tiny minority not according to Francis Welsing's School of Genetics, but according to their School of Genetics, white skin is a genetic recessive trait. I didn't make it that way. That's what it is. And so a tiny population of white people surrounded by genetically dominant people of color, they could be genetically annihilated. Now, is this something they seek and concern themselves with every day, or is it subconscious, as you mentioned? I say conscious and subconsciously determined. Do you see, in other words, if the, at the phase of our history as black people in this area of the world, when do you see people who classify themselves as white would run after a black man and say he thought about thinking about thinking about looking at a white woman, and so therefore we're going to drag him, go to his house, drag him out, tie him to a tree, hang him, and cut off his genitals. Why cut off his genitals? That's where the genetic material is, but, you know, people who classify themselves as white have often on a number of occasions said to me, you know, I never thought about it like that. A patient was in my office just last night, a black woman who has a job massaging mostly white males, and she said she had read the ISIS papers 
And she said, she just, this white male just said to her, I've often wished that I had a black penis. I'm, I'm sorry if that that's not supposed to be on your air. Do you see? And she said, my God, that's what you talk about in the ISIS papers. See, the whole issue of race is, is like, it's a uh, underground tsunami that is going on. For example, we've just gone through this whole period where uh, President Obama and the Congress were, you know, fighting him tooth and nail, so-called, about the budget and sequestration. And how many black people understood all of that storm and angst was about it because it was a black man. We can't have a black man telling us what to do. So we want to see him fail. Now, I don't know if it's true. Somebody told me that there was a report. Somebody in the Congress said to President Obama, it makes me sick to look at you. Mm. See, mm. that level, you know, in other words, you can have ideological disagreements. But when it gets to such a high pitch of hostility and manifesting hate, where people, you know, will call him in the uh, State of the Union a liar, this is another level of activity. And so one who wants to think about reality <laughs> will say, well, what is this all about? Why is this happening? I gave a lecture uh, the second week in October, and I said that America, and in that word America, if you scramble the letters and try to make a phrase, the phrase, I am race. I am race. That America was having a mental breakdown. Do you see? The country, it doesn't matter if the country is turned upside down out of the fear that they were losing racism, white supremacy in the form of a black man being president. And President Obama not only is the first black president, but in his person and in his history and in his parentage, he represents white genetic annihilation. He represents the very essence of white genetic annihilation. Why? Because his mother's white, a genetic recessive state. His father was black, a genetically dominant trait. So the white disappears. If Abraham Lincoln, at the point of emancipation, when he emancipated the slaves in the rebelling states, that if he had extended it and said that everybody was going to be equal as citizens, and so then people, you know, if, if you could imagine, that people then were moving around not paying attention to color, white people would have disappeared. There were more slaves in the South than there were white people. So if everybody had blended, and it wasn't, you know, certainly wasn't a question that white men wouldn't have sexual relations with black women, because all the presidents were doing that. That's why black people are so many different colors because of the level of miscegenation that took place when black people were in bondage. So white would have disappeared. Now we are at a point where they're talking about the white group of people are about to become a minority in America, this area of the world. And then you have a black president, and what was the reaction? The reaction was for people who classify themselves as white to go on a rampage buying guns. And that's what's going on right now. That's 
what's going on right now. And see, even beyond that, all of these little children who are going out getting guns and shooting, and then somebody says, why would that happen? That happens because if we if we are going to recognize the system and culture for what it is, it is a system and culture of racism, white supremacy, a system and culture for white genetic survival. The gun is the means to maintain white supremacy. So that that message doesn't consciously or subconsciously escape children. So you have a problem. Somebody's bothering you. Then you go to the gun closet or the drawer or under the pillow or under the bed, and you pull out the gun, and then you take it and you use it against the people who are bothering you. All right, hold that thought right there, Doc, because we got to take a quick break. Folks, you can join the conversation with Dr. Wilson at 800-450-7876. We'll take your calls right after this quick break. This podcast was recorded by BKRpodcast.com. Hey, thank you for staying with us, folks, and reaching out to us on Facebook and Twitter at CarlNelsonShow.com. Our guest is Dr. Francis Crest Wilson. Dr. Wilson, I'm going to let you finish up what you were saying before the break, and then we've got some folks who want to talk to you as well. Uh, well, I was just talking about, I think we were talking about the gun and the run-on guns and, and right. talking about children, young children, white young children, young people, got a problem, get the gun, and even black young people. Do you see, it's the, the other side of the coin of the system of racism, white supremacy, where black young people and black people in general, the system of racism, white supremacy has taught black people consciously, subconsciously to have negative opinions of themselves as black people and to call themselves names, all the names that are used in rap that are demeaning and degrading that people are absorbing into their thinking. And so all they have to do is be frustrated, and then they start killing one another. And people run around, and why is this happening? We are in a culture and a system where, because it is a system about survival, and the gun and other weapons are the answer to survival, and so the main message that the culture teaches, which is why if you look at the videos, it's all about violence and destruction and what you have to do in the presence of a catastrophe. And it's always guns involved. You see, we don't have any videos and any movies that are talking about we have this critical problem of racism that uh, Gunnar Mygall many years ago called the American Dilemma. But he didn't discuss it in the terms that I'm discussing it. But this is the central core problem in this area of the world and really throughout the world. And if I could wave a magic wand, people would be able to sit down and talk about it and gain understanding. People who classify themselves as white need to have higher levels of self-insight. First of all, why is it important to call myself white? See, that term means I represent, I'm a member of a tiny minority of people on the planet and I'm genetic recessive. And if I want to survive, I have to do certain things. That's the conscious and subconscious communication with the word white. Well, let me interrupt for a second. Is that the same as, uh, you know, we've got some black folks who like to say, to say they're, they're a brown or they're coffee or they're, you know, some other term for not being black, anything but black, but, you know, in all intents and purposes, they are black, but they, they try to, uh, you know, align themselves to a shade. Is that the same thing? Are they well, doing the same it's thing? A, it's a part of the same thing. Do you see? It's like it's a part of the color sickness, hair sickness, feature sickness that people of color have been infected with on a planet dominated by racism and white supremacy. 
because white is the dominant position. And white makes the decisions about who's going to appear on television, what they have to look like if they're going to be on television or be in the movies. Now, you, if you're going to be a maid in the South, you can be another color. Or when they, you know, de do reincarnations of the phase of white supremacy that was formal slavery, then they can have dark-skinned people. But if you're going to be, uh, uh, what shall I say, a concubine for the President of the United States in a series called Scandal, then you have to be a certain sort of mixed race appearance. <laughs> See, everything is about racism, white supremacy. I even had a young white woman call my office yesterday, and what was her discussion? She's at one of the leading universities and studying anthropology, but she is engaged to a black man. So what was her discussion as a white woman? I know that racism is going on, and I'm going to do my best because I know my children will be colored. And I want them to know the reality of racism that they are going to be confronting. And then she talked about the attitudes on race that were in her family. So when we have somebody call in and say, why does Dr. Welsing have to talk about race? Because that is uh, overwhelming. It's not something on the side. It's the whole package. And black people are stumbling around, along at the bottom of the barrel where they have been since formal slavery. Yes, are there Colin Powell's and there's a President Obama and there a Clarence Thomas and there are other individual people who are in the first, the first, the first, the first. But what about the masses of the people? What are the reading scores of the masses of black children? What are they being prepared to do? Where are their jobs? You see, black people will report the latest unemployment statistics and start talking about 7%. It's 40% in some black communities. Uh, that, that, yeah, I want you to talk. We're going to get into scandal in, in, later on, uh, and you know this uh, the love affair with black folks on, uh, with with that TV series. Uh, probably I'm not the best person to ask that because I've never watched it. But we got some people who want to talk to you right now, and you too can reach out to Dr. Francis Quest Welsing at eight hundred four five zero seventy eight seventy six. Go to line three. Samora is joining us from Virginia. Samora, you're on with Dr. Welsing. Yes. Uh, how you doing, Carl? How you doing, Dr. Nel uh, Dr. Welsing? Hi. How are you? I'm doing fine. Um, you you guys are right on target because you, you brought up scandal. That was going to be my first of uh, three points I want to make uh, in my phone call. Um, it's funny how um, when we talk about racism and white supremacy, in Scandal, the TV show, you have a white president, and then you have this black jump-off, you know, side chick, you know, female. And, you know, that show is, you know, it was, up for a potential Emmy, I guess, you know. It's, it's, it's all the talk. But do you remember a couple of months ago that when there was a Cheerios commercial and it was a black husband and a white wife, all oh, the, the Internet and YouTube and everything was just, it was just a buzz. So much vitriolic hatred just spewing across, you know. Um, it was, I mean, it was so much hate. You can feel it. I don't know. If do do call or Dr. Wilson, do y'all remember that Cheerios commercial? Yeah, I remember it, Doc. Yes, I, yes, I think I know the one you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Right, so it, it, it shows you the supremacy aspect. Like, if it's the, even though we're talking about, you know, black and white coming together, when it's a black man with a white woman and they had a child, oh, this is, you know, all hell is breaking loose. 
But when it's a TV show, when it's a white man who's the president that just happened to have his side squeeze as a black girl, then this is, you know, it's all the hype. It gets so much attention. In fact, it's probably nominated for an Emmy. Like, to me, that is not, if that's not like, uh, I see. Well, hang on some more because I, I want to get sure. the, the I want to get her reaction to this because you're right because uh, I've just known so many people uh, I, I'm, I haven't seen it but I just don't understand you know the sisters being the, the side chick and and, and they, they have these scandal parties and then everything freezes in the black community whatever it's show whatever it's on I think it's on Thursday that it comes on TV. Doc, what's going on here? What's what's happening with our people? See now, I would say it depends on what your overall understanding is and what's your understanding of the context for example when I saw that Cheerios commercial I thought that the black man lying on the couch do, do you see it, it, to me that wasn't a positive image just the way he looked mm. he could have been standing up and having a shirt and a tie on no he's laying like you know Lazy black people. Somebody lazy, which somebody just talked about lazy black people mm. in the news today. No job. Do, do you see? So, and so then it's like if you understand the system, what the system is about, and therefore what messages does it want to give out? Right. Hold that thought lazy right there, Doc. black man. Right. Uh, hold, hold that thought right there. Loose black woman. Because we got to take a quick break. And some more, stay, stay with us as well. Folks, you two can yep. join this conversation. Call a friend and tell them that Dr. Wilson's on the radio and she's breaking it down. 800-450-7876. We'll take your calls right after this short break. This podcast was recorded by BKRpodcast.com. And thank you for staying with us, folks. Our guest is Francis uh, Cress Wilson. Dr. Wilson, one of the best psychiatrists in the business, based in Washington, D.C., for the break, we were speaking with Samara in Virginia. And, uh, Doc, I'm going to let you finish. You were talking about uh, the, the Cheerios commercial. You're talking to me, Carl? Yeah. No, I was just saying that the Cheerios commercial, do you see overweight black man lying on the couch? Now, it, you know, what is this image? With health problems. Do, do, do you see what I'm saying? So, in, in other words... People who classify themselves as white, they are a tiny minority on the planet. But because they understand what the deal is, what the planet represents in relationship to themselves, they function as a majority because they understand. Now, they, any person who classifies himself as white who says there's no such thing as racism, they're engaging in denial or lying. An American University professor, after inviting me to participate in a teaching program at Lorton Reformatory when the prison was in operation, and I talked to these black prisoners, males, about racism. So she's driving me back home, and she says, Dr. Welsing, I hate to admit it, but on all social occasions, when it's only white people present and no black people, she said, we are talking negatively about black people. And the assumption is, is that every person present is in agreement. And I told her, I didn't get upset. I told her that I understood that they were simply talking code about white genetic survival, where the black person has to be the enemy, the point of attack. Don't we see it every day when people are talking about President Obama? We see it, it's right in front of us. You know, you can do a call, do a show call at some time where you say all the black people who are employed and who have jobs and who work with white people hmm. have the black people call in who are satisfied with their rate of promotion and their salary compared to their white coworkers. 
you won't get any calls. Those are the people who come stumbling into Dr. Welsing's office in a state of traumatic stress about how they are being demeaned and mistreated on jobs they have to have. See, somebody wants us to believe with these movies about slavery that that was some point in the past. People just have updated clothes. But you have people who classify themselves as white who feel it a necessity, consciously and or subconsciously, to beat up on and demean and harass black people on the job. Or if they've gone too far, to force them out of their jobs. This is going on, and this is why I say you have a call in one time and say, all the black people, please call in. If you are satisfied with what's happening to you in your employment situation in 2013, who are the black people who are being laid off? Who are the black people who are in mortgage foreclosure? So when somebody calls in and says, why is she always talking about Racism, they ought to say it's too bad she's the only psychiatrist in America who has the courage to talk about the reality. Dr. Wilson, can I say something else too? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, to kind of address what you're saying also, is the subtlety is what gets me also. Is like, you know, you talk about uh, President Obama. They. It's always a way that they find a way to uh, cut your cut your title, you know, or or abbreviate you. Like if you look at sports, a lot, not all, but a lot of you know, star African American players, whether you know whatever sport you want to talk about, basketball, football, whatever, they always got like you know RG three. What you just don't want to call him his full name, or OJ Simpson, or TO instead of Terrell Owens, or you know, it's like they, they've got to cut it short. But you don't hear too many white sports players being referred to in an abbreviation. You know, and the same thing goes with President Obama. He's President Obama, President Barack Obama. Whenever you have a lot of um, Republican commentators, Tea Party commentators, they just say Obama or Mr. Obama. And in the same sentence, they'll put the title of another person, like, oh, you know, secretary of such and such. And it's like, well, how come this person gets a title and they're white? But then when you refer to President Obama, you find a way to delete that that title as if I'm not going to acknowledge the fact that you are President of the United States. And, you know, that kind of gets me. Also, you know, I noticed this too. I was having a conversation with my friends. You know, I look back at wrestling. I don't know if you looked at wrestling uh, back in the day, Dr. Ruff, but I know Carl, you're probably familiar with it. It was like, you know, you look at all the wrestling stars back then, you had, like, Mr. T, you know, and then you had Junkyard Dog, like, he's a black man, um, or Coco Beware. They were always, like, animals or this animal, like, animalistic type uh, act, whereas you had everybody else, like, Ted DiBiase, the Million Dollar Man, and he had an assistant, a black assistant named Virgil, who who was basically, like, his butler that would escort him to the ring, like, it's, it's subtle, but it's in your face at the same time. And well, see, again, if, if all of us, black people and white people, if all of us would acknowledge we are in a system of racism, white supremacy, and its patterns of perception, logic, thought, speech, and action, and emotional response. Perception. Henry Louis Gates, in his series on the history of blacks in America, you see, I think that in his program he talks about, one of the historians talked about the slave could not have a first and last name. They had to be a Toby or something other. They say can't have a full name like you belong to somebody. I think the comment was, you know, just have a first name and it's an object, an object that can be demeaned. Right. You see, so if you just if somebody just went through all the major newspapers 
uh, on the East Coast. We don't have to go all over the country. And just look at how many times it's Obama. Obama, not President Obama, such and such and such. It's Obama. No, we will not give him a title just like our long history where black people could not be Mr. Jones or Mrs. Smith. It had to be Hattie or Boy or Buck. Mm. You see, in other words, slavery was a phase of racism, white supremacy. We are still in the system of racism, white supremacy. And as I look at all of these movies that come out about slavery, they want black people to go back and just start focusing on slavery so they don't focus on racism that encompasses slavery. So you won't think about racism. Oh, look how we were treated in the past. And then the people who classify themselves as white. I didn't have anything to do with slavery. It wasn't me. And so then the black people, oh, look at what happened to him and how he was beaten and all of that. Looking back as opposed to looking in the now and thinking about the future. It's not to ignore everybody or to be totally familiar with what happened during the enslavement, hundreds of years of enslavement of African people in that phase of the system of racism, white supremacy. And then bring it on up. And see, this is why younger people are confused. Because we weave in and out, do you see, what we call slavery, and then we call, uh, you know, the civil rights era, and then we were supposed to be post-slavery, but we don't have a narrative that encompasses the in to the total 500-year system dynamic of racism, white supremacy. Right. And this is why I say, you know, I know people are going to be upset, but I'm saying any person, white or black, who refuses to talk about racism, white supremacy, hates black people. You see, it's just like my field of psychiatry. Anybody who pretends to be interested in black mental health, the mental health of black people, and refuses to acknowledge the reality of a system of racism, white supremacy, is not helping black people because that is our reality. There's no black person. You know, have a call in. How many black people escape from white supremacy system today? Right. Hang on, Doc, because we've got to take another quick break at the top of the hour. Some more stay with us because I know you got another question. Sure. Folks, you yeah. two can join the conversation with Dr. Welsing at 800-450-7876. We'll take your calls right after this quick break. This podcast was recorded by BKRPodcast.com. Washington, D.C.'s 1450 WOL Radio and live around the world on WOLDCNews.com. And thank you for joining us or staying with us, folks. Of course, you can always reach us on Facebook and Twitter at CarlNelsonShow.com. I guess he's uh, just the best psychiatrist we got in our community, Dr. Francis Chris Welsing, who's based in Washington, D.C. Before the break, we were speaking with Samari, also calling us from Virginia. And, Dr. Welsing, I'll let you finish with what you were saying before the break. Okay, Carl, remind me of where I... Oh, what were we talking about? I, I, I'm distracted. I've been distracted too. Samara, I could you recall she was re responding to one of your questions? Okay. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, Dr. Welsh, we were referring to how they would uh, cut off uh, a person's first name or last name and basically name them, and they were like ownership. It was ownership of the person in a way. And you're saying that um, we don't talk if we don't discuss. Uh, race, then we're basically uh, culpable in, um, we're just as guilty in uh, propagating it because we're not discussing it. That's what you were saying. Exactly, that we have to talk about it as opposed to having a heart attack every time some black man is stopped and shot and killed. You see, if we talk about what it is, 
if we talk about the fear of white genetic annihilation and therefore the importance of the gun, and this is why subconsciously people who classify themselves as white, you see, I thought he had a weapon. I'm going to do the other. I thought he had a weapon. I thought he had a weapon. Well, that I thought he had a weapon. The weapon is in his pants, his genital apparatus, the genetic material that can cause white genetic annihilation. The gun is the counter to that. That's why if you look at a lateral view, schematic view of male genitalia, you turn it around 90 degrees, you see a gun. The gun is called the great equalizer. In other words, black man can cause my genetic annihilation, must create weapon, can do the same thing. So I create the equalizer. I can shoot you at will. Then we wonder about legislation. Stand your ground. That means that. It doesn't mean any time a black man gets afraid of a white man, he can shoot him. It means any time a person classified as white can say, I thought. He made me nervous. He made me anxious. So I had to kill him. Okay, George Zimmerman, just walk home. If we would talk about reality, we would all advance. You know, I look at China Central on the cable television, and I look at the country is building and building houses and apartment buildings and the children are going to school and they're talking about ending poverty and they're becoming the second dominant power on the planet because they're not all caught up with genetic survival. We can't move forward and make certain that everybody gets educated Everybody has housing. Everybody is employed if the government has to be the employer of last resort, like during the Great Depression. We can't do that. That's what all this, Ob you know, Obamacare, black people should say Obama cares. Separate the words, he cares about the health. But if everybody gets health care, one of the things that caused black people to die early, they didn't get the right health care. I was just talking to one of my colleagues and ph physicians earlier today, and he was saying we're moving towards two-tier health care, where they're not going to be physicians in the black community. They're going to be medical techs and, and nurses. Wealthy communities will have MDs. Just had this conversation four hours ago. So if we, you see, again, the one of the major things that is annihilated in the system of racism, white supremacy, is black self-respect. And I say that racism, white supremacy, plus low-level black self-respect equals genocide. Where contrary, high levels of black self-respect means that a willingness to look at a negative reality that is impacting your life and the life of your children and your grandchildren. Instead of avoiding it and going into the fantasy illusion of inclusion, you look at it and you talk about it and you dissect it. And this discussion is not about wasting time hating white people. That's cheap. But we have to be, as Eric Holder said, courageous enough to talk about this critical problem. Anytime people's major classification is their so-called racial category, you are bound into a system of racism, white supremacy. Dr. Wells, yeah. uh, can I ask you a question, too, because uh, I don't want to uh, be too long? Um, Carl, you know, I listened to Mark uh, talk one day, and he had mentioned this book, uh, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. So I bought it and I read it, and it was a very, very deep book. And 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 
I listen to what Dr. Wilson says, and also I reflect on what I read inside that book. And, I mean, it's going on now. I don't know, Dr. Wilson, have you ever read Brave New World by Aldous Huxley? Long time ago, yes. That book right there shows you, it, like, they had society stratified, like, this is an alpha citizen, this is a beta citizen, this is a gamma citizen. And, you know, then he was talking about, like, how the Negro citizen is of the lowest grade. He was like a gamma citizen, you know, and how they were breeding children, um, and they were selecting the genes. What would make them a better, what would make them a alpha, alpha was the best. What would make them the better uh, genetic survivor of all. And it's like now, I'm, Carl, I'm going to tweet you as soon as I get off the phone. I'm going to tweet you this article. There's an article that came out in the Wall Street Journal, I think this week, where they were talking about there's a company now where they, um, you can design your baby. The name of the article is Designer Baby. Handpicked process can lead to selection of genes for specific traits, where they now have a process factor where they can go ahead and just select certain genes. And, I mean, you know, they've already sequenced the whole human genome. So really it's just a matter of, you know, selecting the allele, which has the gene that you want, and then pairing it, you know, with uh, the the mate, you know, the other mate. And, it, they, I mean, they really were talking about a lot of future implications, like, okay, well, if I want my child to, you know, be better, or if we, if we find more evidence of here's a smart gene for intelligence or something like that, I can select that. And now the problem is this. How many African American people will have the finances to even participate in that process? So, seeing that you don't even have the financial capital to even participate in the selection of the gene, you know, you look at the majority of whites where they already talked about are out beating us out uh, as far as income. They can go ahead and select for genes that may, you know, give them longevity because they just have the capital and now they have the science and the money to uh, further their agenda. But all that's right. all I'm going to say. And, uh, Carl, I'll teach you the article. Dr. Welch, right. it's always a pleasure talking to you. Well, you, you know, I think that, uh, let me just refer you to the uh, situation in, in England recently where they found out that two Nigerian nine-year-old twins, a male and a female, are the smartest children that have ever been tested and taken their standard exams in the history of England. Two black children that the parents didn't go to some bank and select blue eyes, blonde hair, white skin. That's just like Richard Williams and his wife. Richard Williams said, I'm going to produce my own genetic material, my wife's genetic material, and we're going to produce some of the greatest tennis players in the world. And so they produced a Serena Williams and a Venus Williams. We don't need to change our gene package. We need to understand the environment. Environment always interacts with the genetic base. If you have a destructive environment that is seeking to suppress and inferiorize you, it will look like your gene package is off. Black people are the mothers and fathers of everybody on this planet. White people as well as all of the other colors. We are the first people, the first human beings, not some higher ape. The first human beings were black people. Black people are the only people who can produce all of the colors. So if we go around thinking something is wrong with our genetic package, and I would dare say 90% of black people would go for, well, I think I want lighter skin, white skin, and I like blue eyes, and I like right. blonde hair. Hold, hold that thought right there, Doc, because we got to take a quick break for traffic and weather. Folks, you can join the conversation with Dr. Welsing at 800-450-7876. We'll take your calls right after this quick break. This podcast was recorded by BKRPodcast.com. And thank you for staying with us, folks. And I guess Dr. Francis Chris Wilson will let us get back in a moment. But just got a news and information in our newsroom here. The, uh, uh, it's uh, Howard University at the Yardfest, the uh, annual uh, 
uh, homecoming concert that was sort of delayed. They had some injuries over there. Eight, eight people, they say, got injured because uh, people tried to rush the, the uh, stage or rush the gate. It's usually it's free, and, and this year they decided to charge $5. And uh, But anyway, the, the show started, and supposedly with Big Sean, uh, Juicy J, Bone Thugs, and Harmony are supposed to be performing. So just be careful out there, folks. But uh, it did cause some problems. Police had to be called to calm it down. So hopefully things will get on the way back again out over at Howard University. I guess is who speaks at Howard every Thursday. You still at Howard every Thursday, uh, Dr. Uh, no, Wilson? the second Thursday of every month, seven the second Thursday. Okay, yes, we had a question about, about racism. Uh, that's the only purpose of the Institute. I call it a free mental health clinic uh, so we can talk about reality and get our heads straight so we don't have to constantly expect other people who can't to do things for us. If we understand the reality and the context, we can make appropriate decisions and do things for ourselves, being convinced that uh, we want to have the highest level of functioning with our genetic and constitutional potential second to none. I mean, you know, just look at the black achievement. All you have to do is just look at the individual black achievement, and you say, wow, if we really knew how to handle ourselves in this context, which is the same thing as a person who is on a football field understanding the game of football. They don't go on the football field with a tennis racket. And in effect, by thinking we're in a system of democracy when we are in a system of racism and white supremacy, so we come on the field ill-prepared. We're not thinking correctly because we don't understand correctly about what is going on. But if we understood, and we understood the importance of what I call black revolutionary sex, which is where people are not playing with sex and producing children they can't take care of and tossing children into foster care, which is no different than when we were on the slave plantation and we were breed, breeding, we were, you know, being programmed to breed to produce more slaves to be sold to different plantations. Now we are encouraged to play with sex, breed, and to fill up the prisons. Now, if we begin to understand, oh, wow, this is a fantastic strategy that's being imposed on us. Now, what if we took seriously black life? And black men and black women were respecting themselves and respecting the act of self-reproduction. And they were only producing offspring when they were committed to each other and committed to the development of their children. And as long as the war of racism and white supremacy is going on, no more than two, no closer together than three years apart, and not reproducing until they were in their 30s, in the meantime going to school and gaining skills and developing themselves to the point that they would be mature parents as opposed to what is being imposed upon us, the cheapening of sex, Everybody should get USA Today and look at it. Look at the lead article about how sex and sex is selling and, you know, all of that being imposed on people's thinking. And so if we begin to understand and say, well, this is what we are going to be doing, because we are going to maximally develop ourselves and be who we are supposed to be on this planet, in the system of racism and white supremacy, we're supposed to be the clowns, the entertainers, the buffoons, and the people who are acting stupid and killing each other. We have to decide that's not who we are supposed to be on this planet. All right, 800-450-7876. Let's see if we, Dolores is still with us online, too, in Northwest D.C. Dolores? Is Dolores still there? Yes, hello. Yes, you're on, you're on with Dr. Wells. Um, hi, Carl. Hi, Dr. Francis Wells. Hi, um, how are you? I'm fine. Um, this is my observation, but I also have a question. 
and maybe after giving me that information, maybe I might come to your think tank at Howard University. I'm an alumni in the social work department anyway. Uh, but um, I've been in D.C. for over 45 years, and I've been in the social service slash social work profession for over 25 years. And at one point in this city, um, you could get a job after going to college, getting your career in the federal, local, nonprofit, with or without your credentials. But as this city has changed its dynamics, I am noticing that the criteria has changed. And that once upon a time, I remember when we didn't even have a national exam, okay? Um, but I am looking at the dynamics in this city changing, and I'm noticing that every year they are setting standards, which is affecting the black professionals. And so it really hit home when you mentioned about uh, black folks are catching it on their jobs right now in 2013. And so I'm very upset because I'm also noticing that the government, it's, it's gatekeeper. It's like they are hooked up with the national organization, organizations. They are the ones who are oppressing our candidates every time they go and, and apply to, to become a social worker or a nurse. Or, and I'm seeing it across the board with other professions when I've gone to different conferences and, and I've met and talked to people. I'm even appalled that I noticed this year they put a criteria in place where you now have to take a police clearance, an FBI clearance. You're subjected to this exam that only 70% of black folks, social workers, I'm saying, are passing this exam because this national exam is really the white man's thinking exam, and it's very subjective. I mean, you can say, oh, how? let's all meet downtown. If you go straight down 16th Street and I go straight down Georgia Avenue, we're still going to get downtown, but because I didn't go your way, you're going to say your way was the better way. And so my, my thinking is, and my question, how as we as a people can get together and look at how – they are attacking the, the middle class because, see, when they started attacking the, the poor communities, it was okay. You know, they closed low housing projects that gave them vouchers, told them they can move anywhere. Let's get rid of them because they started seeing the importance of this city and the real estate here. But now they're they are attacking the middle class, and if you want to hurt them, you hurt them in the pocket. So you start getting them where they can't get jobs and they can't take care of their families. And so I've never seen it like this before. I'm talking about professionals in all professions, even your profession. Matter of fact, I work for the mental health now, and people are really stressed because they can't find jobs, and these are professionals. So how can we link that we're being oppressed, that this, this system, and I'm saying this system, meaning even trying to keep your credentials has been a problem. I'm hearing people complain, I can't even keep up with my credentials to be to stay a social worker. I can't even afford some of the trainings to stay a social worker. How can we use that as a way of saying that maybe a class action lawsuit or or maybe rep, you know reparations? Can we link maybe professionally being oppressed to reparations? Well, you see, I would say think about it this way. When the people who classify themselves as gay feel that they are being discriminated against as a group in some form or fashion, they speak to it. They speak to it. You see, they don't they don't go around saying, I don't know why somebody would be talking about discrimination against gays. No, they speak to it even if they have to exaggerate the level that it exists. But if you have black people who, you see, they don't want to think about who they are. They want to have the illusion of inclusion. Because unless they are included in a group other than themselves, they don't feel right. Because tragically, this is what has happened to black people under racism. See, we don't, you know, in D.C. right now, you don't have black people coming together and thinking about what would be in their interest in the city. But you have people who classify themselves as white saying our dogs need to have dog parks where they can socialize. Exactly. 
We need to have bypass. You see, they will speak to their interest. And black people won't even speak to the fact that they are being gentrified out of the cities as they're being gentrified out of Chicago and gentrified out of Philadelphia. Black people won't even bother to say, well, what does that word actually mean? It means black out. So but why won't we, we speak? Have self-respect. Why, why won't we speak to those issues, Doctor Wilson? <laughs> That's a good question, Carl. Uh-huh. See, but I say that my assignment is: if I see the problem, my responsibility as a third-generation black physician is to talk about it. That I see my group of people being harmed. And just like Harriet Tubman said, I could have freed many more if they knew they were slaves. You see, but this ignorance that has been imposed upon us and this self-hatred that has been imposed upon us. So I don't want to be black. I want to be mixed. That's a mindset of I hate black. See, why do I have to be called black? I hate black. But people who classify themselves as white don't have any problem. They don't call themselves Caucasians. They don't call themselves Euro-Americans. They say we're white because skin color and the genetics that go with it and the demographics that go with it are critical to their survival, and they understand that. So again, we are walking on the football field with a tennis racket and wondering why we are run over. We don't even have the right equipment on. Right, because we've got to take a quick break, and I'll let you finish up with Dolores on the other side. Folks, you can join the conversation with Dr. Francis Press Welsing. It's real simple. It's 800-450-7876. We'll take a call. This podcast was recorded by BKRPodcast.com. And thank you for staying with us, folks. And I guess uh, Dr. Francis Chris Wilson. I uh, see a bunch of folks want to talk to you. Dolores, uh, on line two, have you, have you finished your question? I think she has then. Let's, let's, go to, uh, let's go to line six. Dale's in Michigan on line six. Dale? Uh, hello, uh, Dr. Welsing and uh, Carl. How are you today? Fine. How are you? Great. I have to tell you, Dr. Welsing, I had an opportunity to uh, uh, purchase your book and read it, um, the ISIS papers, and uh, I had the opportunity to uh, listen to your lectures on YouTube. And uh, I have to say, uh, I'm uh, blown away, quite impressed. And uh, really, there was nothing, absolutely nothing that I could find, not to say I was looking for anything to disagree with, but... Uh, Basically, what it, it confirmed suspicions and feelings, but you were able to back it up by factual evidence. So for that, um, I'm thankful for uh, the work uh, that you've done. You know, as for myself, you know, coming up, I always, well, basically, I kind of was brought up in a black nationalist mindset, which to my understanding was to take from what was considered the dominant society all information, technology, or anything worth of value, and then go ahead and bring it back to the community that you came from and apply it there, adapt, adapt it as necessary so that your community could go ahead and uh, flourish and prosper like everyone else. But I tell you, you know, it seems that um, a lot of people, instead of having a mindset such as that, more or less had the mindset of what was referred to earlier, which was the illusion of inclusion. You know, they opted for that option instead of um, maybe a more difficult uh Road, road to go, but um, all I can say is that I appreciate your prescription. You know, it's a difficult prescription to uh, to uh, take in, but uh, because you have to look at yourself and look at your your shortcomings. But if you're willing to do that, then you're able to go ahead and um, to move forward on this. Uh, I'm not just sitting here spinning my wheels. You know, the one thing that a lot of a lot of people talk about, well, why is this, why is that, or why isn't somebody doing this, that, and the other? I take the viewpoint of what is it that I can do. You know, the first thing, you know, and the first thing that I had to do was, one, improve myself, educate myself, 
and then apply what I've learned in terms of uh, my immediate environment. You know, and I've done that here in this town. I'm continually doing it, even to the point of uh, putting together an Internet radio station just to have a communications point between here and Detroit and Chicago. You know, because we're kind of like here in no man's land, and I thank goodness for the Internet and that this program's on WOL, so at least there's information available such as yours and the program such as uh, Carl's to where people have the opportunity at least to have access to information right. and to be able to go ahead and act on it. I really didn't have a question to ask you. I just wanted to go ahead and thank you for the work that you've done. Continue on. Uh, I look forward to any additional things that you put out on uh, YouTube. And, Carl, uh, the guests that you have on this program, they're stellar. Because I'm, I, it's like you're getting fed every day with the data that's coming through. So I just wanted to thank both of you for what you're doing. Thank right. you. Thanks, Dale. Uh, let's keep moving then. Let's go to line five. Raheem in D.C. Raheem, you have a question for Dr. Wilson? You got the, first of all, let me say, Brother Carl, what's going on? First, let me say, Doctor, I love you to death. Second of all, I don't want you to break out the gut when I disagree with you on a couple <laughs> of things. I mean, you're using the word illusion of inclusion. In my book, that would be Barack Obama. Now, in a short sense, let me explain. I'm not, I'm, I, I am with you on the white supremacy thing. But I think the problem with our elders, y'all not really explaining to us in a sense, the other ways of white supremacy, meaning how a black person can be used for white supremacy. Now, I heard you say the Obama can, and I heard you say that Obama kids. In my book, and in a lot of the young people's books, and I'm saying the younger generation, they would disagree with you wholeheartedly, because at the end of the day, due to technology, the younger generation, our information is coming in a little more faster. We don't have to necessarily go to a library or read a book. Everything is on the Internet. Like, I didn't know about your book, the ISIS Papers, until I went to YouTube. So what I'm saying is, we're watching people like you, Omar Johnson, listening to Carl, uh, Dr. Carl, and what's happening is, our information is coming in different from y'all. So we're going to be looking at white supremacy in a different fashion. Like I say with me, I think Obama would be the example of the illusion of inclusion. And I, I just want to hear what you guys say about that, Doc. Please don't pop me for disagreeing with you. Oh, absolutely no. That you are certainly welcome to uh, to your opinion. I would just ask that you focus on how we can decide that we are going to as individuals are working together to solve our problems. Everybody is not going to be in disagreement, in agreement, but we are all beset by the same problem that we have to solve that has been our problem for the last 500 years. Let me, uh, Carl, if I may, let me just uh, read something that I call the black orientation exercise. And people can reflect on it, but I said if we say this to ourselves every day, I recognize that I am in a power system dynamic of racism and white supremacy. I am going to respect and value myself as a black person. I will ask God to give me the courage to look at and understand what is really happening to myself and other black people. And I will practice those basic behaviors that reflect black self-respect and black mental health. And by those behaviors, I'm taking from the work of Neely Fuller, uh, Jr. and his textbook for victims of racism, these very basic behaviors. Stop name-calling one another. Stop squabbling with one another. Stop cursing one another. Stop being discourteous and disrespectful to one another. Stop stealing from one another. Stop robbing one another. Stop fighting one another. And stop killing one another. Stop snitching on one another for reasons of personal gain. And I add to that list, 
stop using and selling drugs to one another, stop making making black children or allowing black children to think that as children they can be adequate mothers and fathers. Stop throwing down trash where black people live, work, and play. Stop making dirt and filth the norm. Stop pretending that racism, white supremacy does not exist. Stop allowing black, brown, red, yellow people being divided by racism, white supremacy. So I just uh, want to share that as the kind of orientation. No, everybody is not going to agree, but for those people who do recognize that racism, white supremacy has been our historic problem, our 500-year-old problem as it has gone through its various phases of enslavement and the so-called Jim Crow period, the civil rights period, we are still dealing with the problems in spite of the fact that there is a black person as president of the United States. And so for those people who want to move and use their life energy, pushing back against this injustice, and focusing on it. And of course, there'll be people who say racism doesn't exist and it's not a problem, and I don't want to focus on it. But for those who do, and to believe that if we end up with a critical mass of people who are saying they want to replace a system of injustice with a system of justice, meaning no one is mistreated, no one is allowed to be mistreated, and those who need the most help get the most help. And to believe that this is something that can be accomplished by black people on this planet if we move our energy in that direction. All right, hold that thought right there, Dr. Welsey, because we're going to take another quick break. Folks, you can join the conversation. You have a question for Dr. Welsey. It's 800-450-7876. Take your calls right after this quick This podcast was recorded by BKRpodcast.com. Thanks for rolling with us, folks, and our guest, uh, Dr. Francis Chris Welsing. And as you mentioned, is it every Thursday you're at Howard? No, second Thursday. Second Thursday. Second Thursday, Thursday of every month, September through June. And uh, we're on 7 campus. to 10 p.m. in Blackburn Center. In the Blackburn Center, 7 to 10 p.m., folks. People have been asking and tweeting, asking, uh, you're going to be there. All right, have you finished with, with uh, Raheem's question? He says he disagreed with you. Uh, no, that that's okay. <laughs> you know, he, he has a, a different opinion, but I would encourage... I would encourage younger black people, see, a part of being taught to disrespect uh, ourselves as black people, it's like dismiss. Younger people dismiss what the older black people have to say. You know, cultures that are really grounded, they rely on and they think about what have our elders said, what have our elders experienced. What can we learn from them so we do not have to reinvent the wheel? Now, that's what, uh, you know, a viable, intelligent culture of people, that's what they do. You, you see, there are no cultures on the planet that have lasted over time that dismiss the experience of people who have gone before. That doesn't mean that they will agree with everything. But as long as the problem exists, do you see, that's like you go to school and you learn, you learn different things. If you study chemistry, you are studying what people have put together about the elements that make up the planet and the universe. You're studying thinking that goes back centuries. If you study mathematics, you're studying ideas that go back centuries. And so, you know, the whole idea of uh, younger people, I mean, I wish that young people would magically solve the problems that we have. But it doesn't work like that. See, to me, Doc... That's almost an insult to young people because you're almost saying that you don't have faith in it. No, sir. That's, you know, that's not of, what I'm saying. 
You know that's not what I'm saying. I work with young people. I'm a physician for young people. So that's not that's not what I'm saying. I say that you don't dismiss. You know, it's like if you had a grandmother, a great grandmother, a grandfather, a great grandfather. Even if you didn't learn anything from them but how to fish effectively. That he learned from his father. And me, he may have learned from his grandfather. So well, you, you, I'm understand. sure you know that's not what I'm saying. When I talk I about, mean, do, do you see, a people looking forward so that they really maximally develop their genetic and constitutional potential or pay attention to when you are ready to bring children in the world so you don't end up abandoning them and have emotional scars for the rest of their lives. So, you know, I know you understand that that's not what I'm saying. I, I understand. I, I didn't mean it in that way. But what I'm saying is, this to me, that's another part of white supremacy, making the old fight the young. It's almost in the sense that y'all don't look at us to be leaders. Y'all expect us to mess up. It's almost like saying, the knowledge that you give me, doctor, I kind of tweak it in a 2013 version. And I think that is the problem that we actually have in this conversation. I respect you to the utmost. You know, I'm actually taking in all of the information that you're giving me. But it seems like sometimes younger people, when it comes to our elders, y'all really don't want us to teach y'all. And I think sometimes the elders do need to be taught to live in this day and age because we don't live in the same time. And we still do respect our elders. It might not be done in the same fashion, but we do. But at the same time, I don't think our elders can always tell us that we're messing it up. In a way, we we listening to our elders. So it's kind of, it will be our elders' fault, and I'm not blaming you. It's like you're not blaming me. It's vice versa, the same thing you're telling me. So at the end of the day, that's still white supremacy. Once the us young black males and females can agree with our elders, then we can start progress. Because y'all are responsible for us, and we're responsible for y'all history. And at the end of the day, I don't think we get the credit for it. I love you always, Dr. Francis. All the time. You know I love you too, right? <laughs> yes, ma'am. All right, thanks, Ray. Thanks for your call. No problem. All right. Uh, let's keep rolling. Let's go to uh, Mrs. Richardson. Mrs. Richardson, you have a question for for, yes. for Doctor Wilson? Yes, dear. How are you today? Hi, Francis. How are Hi, you, dear? How are you? Okay. Fine, dear. We love you too. You know, Francis uh, tells everything, Carl, the way it T I is. That's what uh, Reverend Mosel Fuller, with us, the late Mosel Fuller, the Reverend of Radio One, tell it like it. You know, see what some people don't understand is that. Uh, the masses, like Dr. Francis said, the masses are not getting it. See, it's the masses who are being ripped off in the black culture that are being persuaded to, to uh, other way, other men's way of life. And to, uh, to go along with that flow, you know, go along with their okie dokes or, or, or have the black man still uh, at the bottom to, to you know, sort of meal up to this this white supremacist and some some of our people just don't get it it doesn't ring to them you know it didn't ring to me i must admit until i was about 56 years old i was, I was as ignorant as some of the others <laughs> Ms. Richard, do totally us a favor because we're running out of time okay. put in a question for him so but, she but can respond my question to doctor and then i want to if she could respond uh, what what will it take for the masses to understand uh, what, what they've got, the responsibility that what you and Dr. Neely always talks about, these things we've got to do and implement ourselves? Because one thing I see about the differences is that how white people will keep certain things in place, no matter how time changed. The man before me said, oh, you got to change with the times. 
But do you know that's what they want us to buy into and keep changing with their time? See, they want the time slot and the nonsense and the junk and the filth to go on to where they can keep their things implemented in place. And if you can understand what I'm saying, I think Dr. Wilson does, to keep their way, to have the power to keep these things implemented and going and having all black people the mass is thinking they got to go along with the flow and got to go along with the you know changing of the times. But the changing of the times is uh, for the, for the be the betterment for their uh, the white race because they're keeping these things in place to work for the power to keep them in in a powerful position. If you understand what I mean. But I love the both of you and God and have a nice weekend, Dr. Francis and Carla. Thank you so much. Same to you. Do you want to respond to anything she said, Dr. Wilson? Uh, well, I would just say, see, there is such a thing as the maintenance of power. And once you understand what, you know, what a particular group considers to be important to them, for example, their survival. And so then they structure a power dynamic that has that at its core and as its centrality. And so they, there may be adjustments and changes around the edges, but the changes are always consistent with maintaining what is their key importance. And so, and they don't change that. You see, they don't, they don't change that basic. And so I would just say, this is it's important for us to have something at our core and at our core ought to be the maximal development of the black genetic and constitutional potential and if a system a power system dynamic of racism white supremacy has another viewpoint and wants to prevent the maximal development of the black genetic and constitutional potential then that's the thing that we have to understand. And if it takes a thousand generations to solve the problem, we need to be able to stay on course and learn from generation to generation. Of course, I'm not planning for it to take a thousand generations, but we have to pass along knowledge, pass along understanding, and respect ourselves and respect one another so that we can achieve what we are supposed to be on this planet and whatever you call the creative force in the universe that made black people the mothers and fathers of everybody on this planet. We need to be questioning what was the purpose of that? What did the creative force in the universe understand about what black people contain to make them the mothers and fathers of everybody? And it's always up to the parents to get the house straight. And I guess it doesn't matter if we don't have everyone on the same page. Oh, absolutely. So you just need a critical mass. A critical, I won't put a number on it, but a critical mass that will bring about, you know, from a quantitative change to a qualitative change. And so, you know, I get calls from people, people who say, you know, when I first heard you 20 years ago, I knew you were crazy. Somebody said that to me up at the Safeway in Silver Spring. And then they said, but now I understand what you're talking about. I have colleagues in psychiatry who said uh, at a meeting in Toronto this past July, Francis, you have been talking to us about this for 40 years. This is a psychiatrist up in Boston. Now I really understand what you're saying. So, hey. It takes a long time, and my father, Dr. Henry N. Kress, he used to say to us, because we would say, Daddy, you told us that before, and he would say, repetition has its virtue. And so if it's important, you say it over and over and over and over again. And that Excellent point. probably sticks. That's why we keep having you on, and we thank you for joining okay, us today. Carl. Thank you, Dr. Francis Chris Welsey. Uh, and again, she's at Howard. She said every second Thursday in the Blackburn Center on campus or those in D.C. Check her out. Uh, let's see. Is the Skybox open tomorrow? Is Morgan there?
Skybox open the It line. absolutely is, Carl. All right, what you going to be talking about? Uh, of course, we're going to have to recap all this homecoming madness.